Though I used to dream of scaling this farm up really, really big. Like I'm talking massive. But after doing this whole farming thing for a couple of years, I no longer think that way. Please allow me to explain why. You know, people will often look at my little rinky dink duck, goose, cattle, tree, pig, and bee farm. And oh yeah, I can't forget that we also do chickens. And they'll see the sustainable farming practices that we use. And the skeptics will say, oh yeah, that's great but you're never gonna feed the world that way. And it's not like they're wrong, because at the scale that our farm operates, yeah, we couldn't even feed Vermont, which is the second least populated state in the United States, let alone the world. But even if my farm had like a thousand head of cattle, I don't think I'd be able to feed Vermont, let alone the world. And so I've started to wonder lately, is that really the right goal to choose? and is trying to achieve operational scale and growing as large as you possibly can, the right goal I should be aspiring to. Because isn't that how modern agriculture got so screwed up in the first place? Holy moly, would you guys look at that sunrise? I do not think I'm gonna be able to do it justice capturing it on camera here, but it is just absolutely gorgeous up here today. You know, the more and more I do this farming thing, the more and more I'm realizing that there is a certain beauty in having a one-man farm. And I know a lot of folks out there are gonna scoff at that, but please allow me to explain my logic. So yes, this right here is my collection of egg laying hens right now. Got about 20 or so, 23 I think. They live inside this mobile chicken coop. I move it every three or four days, giving them fresh pasture. They follow our cattle. And so we essentially have this symbiotic system where the chickens follow the cattle. They pick through the cow pies, like the one you see right down there. In the warmer months, they'll eat all the fly larvae. And that helps reduce the flies that are bothering our cattle. And then as an added bonus, our farm gets eggs. Over the next two years, I actually plan on expanding out my egg laying fly a bit more but I'm not gonna go crazy and I'm not gonna do this with like a thousand hens or two thousand hens because again I'm trying to keep this farm to a scale where simply one person can do it you know one of the questions I'll often get from viewers is when do I plan on hiring people or am I gonna bring interns onto the farm or do something like that and honestly I have no intention of doing something like that because I just don't want to deal with that. You know, when I was working in the corporate world, I would often have large budgets and large teams where I would have like 50 people reporting to me indirectly or directly. I'd have budgets of millions of dollars where I'd have multiple advertising agencies with dozens of people decked to our accounts working for us. And that management thing was making me very unhappy. And very much what I found is that what makes me happy is taking care of creatures and building and creating things. And the more I scale my farm operation up, the less I'll be able to do the things that actually bring me joy. I want you guys to notice this Rhode Island red chicken right here in the center of the frame. Notice how her feathers look all bad and patchy. That's because she's starting to go through her molt. Most of the chickens will go through their molt probably in the next, I don't know, eight weeks or so as they get ready for winter. Basically what happens is they lose all of their existing feathers and they regrow new feathers. The one downside to when molting happens means that their egg production starts to lower. In fact, as daylight starts to get scarcer and scarcer, I mean, I'm recording this right now and it's like 7.30 in the morning. That means that the chickens and the ducks are gonna stop laying eggs or lay a lot less eggs. And they're gonna have that lower production until we get into like say February or March. So the crew to moo right now has eaten down this entire grazing lane. So it's time for me to move them over to the next grazing lane. I just took a couple of minutes and drove back and forth and back and forth with the ATV over here. Because the grass is so long in this section and I don't think my cattle have grazed it all year, I had to do that just so that the tall grasses wouldn't short out the fence as I put it down. And yes, it's officially warming up this morning. Like started out in the mid 40s Fahrenheit. It's supposed to get up into the mid 70s again, which for October in Vermont is very warm. These are the life hacks that you learn when you're a one person farm.
As you can see right here, Baby B has cut the line yet again. I just finished making the new paddock. And while all the other cattle are waiting patiently, Baby B gets the best grass. Macho man, are you trying to knock my fencing reel? So this is really only temporary. The fence actually isn't even on, but the cattle know to respect it. So what I'm gonna do now is take down that divider, let them walk across, and then take that reel connect that so that the cattle just get this one grazing cell i'll probably only keep them here in this for this morning the quality of the forage is not very good in this spot it's mostly weeds and so what i really want to have them do is go through trample all the weeds eat as much grass as they can and then in the afternoon i'll move them down to the next row hey girls. come on girls. fresh grass fresh grass come on hey girls. fresh grass fresh grass come on fresh grass fresh grass come on So it looks like Macho Man, Amanda, and Baby B are taking their sweet time. There's actually some good munching grass here on this alleyway, but in just a minute, I'm gonna move them over. Everybody else has found the other spots. All right, you two, come on. Time to move, time to move, let's go. Macho Man, let's go, come on. Move! Come on, Macho Man, that's the downside to having a friendly bull. You have to be very patient with him. So if you look all the way down the line there, the cattle probably have, I don't know, eight or nine days worth of grazing in this strip before I move them further down that way. And then I'll run them all the way down that line and then all the way back down again. And then probably by that point, it'll be too cold to have them up here and I'll have to move them down to the barn for winter. But now before I'm done with cattle chores, I still have to move the water trough. Hey, Mr. Toby Dog, stand and watch over your birds. Don't worry, pal, I'll be back with you in a minute. Let's go, flashlight. Time to do your bathroom break. So in case anybody's wondering, Abby Dog is still healing up. You can say hi to your friend, Toby Dog. It's okay, sweetie, let's go to the bathroom. Come on, we're going for your little walk. She's still living inside the house. I gotta give her probably, I don't know, another week, week and a half of being indoors before she gets to come back outside full time. She continues to be a model house dog, which is something I would have never ever expected. Not a single bathroom problem inside the house, no behavior issues. She's very relaxed and she hangs out with us downstairs. When she's unsupervised, she likes to just chill out in the mud room. I would have never suspected she would be a model house dog, but here we are. Hi, Piggly Wigglies. So sad news for the pig fans. Pig butchering is actually going to happen tomorrow. So I don't know if you guys have noticed in the last couple of days I've created this alleyway. What I'm gonna do is, this is gonna be how I herd them in this way and then kind of mask this off so that the other pigs don't watch it happen. But ultimately we're gonna do it all up there. And so they've got this little path that I've been getting them used to. So it should be relatively easy to move them. You've been very good girls. You've done a good job. But unfortunately your time is about up here on the farm. I will say that the pig experiment has worked out very well. In terms of my feed costs, I've done exactly what I've wanted to do. But I will say, I also don't think it would really scale up much more than, say, three, maybe five pigs. Like, the moment I start getting, say, like a dozen pigs, I'm going to have to rely mostly on purchased grains. And so the idea of doing sustainably raised pork kind of goes out the window the moment that you start to scale things up. Which, again, gets to why I think I want to continue to be a one-person farm. You know, from my experience, in the business world, what I always found was there was such a pressure to reach scale and have something be scalable and profitable. And our farm actually has been profitable. Even if you take away all the social media and sponsorships and junk, our farm is profitable, has been profitable for the last several years. When you look at the revenue generated, subtracting the costs and expenses that are associated with creating that revenue, you know, last year we made like 18,000, almost $19,000. I don't have the final tally for this year, but I anticipate it's going to be somewhere in that same ball park and I know there's gonna be a lot of folks out there who say oh that's cute you've got a nice hobby farm there buddy but why is it that the idea of scale and growing something very large is like always the target and that's always the mission that people are pushing you towards come on flashlight let's go inside like maybe the thing about agriculture is it isn't so much about scalability of a business model. Maybe it's got a lot more to do with repeatability. You know, I was actually just watching a video by a guy by the name of Ben Falk, who's a permaculturalist here in Vermont. And he had this whole rap, which I'll leave a link for down below. But the gist of his spiel was that even things that are really good, whenever they try to scale up and expand, they usually get kind of crappy. And in Ben's video, he used the example of a seed producer here in Vermont, as well as a butter producer and a taco producer 
where the more they scale up, the worse their product gets. And yes, I'm scaling up because these are gonna be next year's egg producers. Most of them will lay eggs, but then I'm also gonna be doing some experiments with breeding and crossbreeding to make a more climate adapted and free range adapted egg producer to follow my cattle. And for me, you know, Ben's point is really well taken because I feel very good about the practices that we have here on our farm. I don't think we're perfect. We still use way too much plastic. We still import way too much feed for our animals. And so from an environmental standpoint, I think we actually have a lot more progress to make. You know, as our trees end up producing more, I think that that's gonna help things a little bit, but I have a lot of work to still do on that front. But when it comes to the welfare of our animals, I actually couldn't feel any better. You know, I genuinely strive to ensure that our animals have only one bad day and they lead these great lives where they're able to range around the farm and be a chicken or be a cow or be a pig. And yes, while many of them are being raised for meat and they will have that one bad day, overall, I try to ensure that my animals have a good life. Would I really feel that way if I had a thousand chickens or 500 head of cattle? I'd like to think the answer would be yes, but I know given the way things usually work, it's probably a no. <laughs> Little guy. So the ducks and geese are actually mad at me because I've taken extra time doing cattle chores this morning and talking to you guys, so I'm a little late on feeding them. Hang on guys, I'll be right with you. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Something caught Toby's attention over there. Look at the solar panels. He is mad. Sorry ducks and geese, I'm gonna go investigate what Toby's looking at. What is it, Toby Dog? What made you have to run all the way up to the top of the hill? I'm looking to see if I see it. I don't see anything out there. Doesn't mean that there isn't anything out there. So yeah, Toby Dog is on high alert right now, which is unusual for, I don't know, what is it, 8.30 in the morning? All right, I'm gonna do my thing. Cause I can already see I have an army of ducks following me up the hill. I know a couple of you guys have asked for a full tree review and I will do a video around that. Just got so much other stuff I gotta cover first. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, look at that chestnut tree. That is pretty good. That mulberry tree is also looking really good. That chestnut and that mulberry are not looking very good. And the other ones down the line are looking okay. But yeah, growing these trees can be a little bit hit or miss. All right, duckery dudes. I know you want your food. You're hungry. There's less and less insects as the night gets colder. I have to feed you more and more. Thus is the great trade-off of Vermont. I mean, here's another good combination, right? Got this beautiful black locust tree. Got another good chestnut tree over there. And this mulberry tree, which I had to cut out of its tube this year because it was busting out so much. I'm telling you, if we didn't have that late frost, we would have had mulberries this year for sure. So we've been having visitors to the farm lately. You know, we butchered 55 geese this fall and we sold all 55 geese at this point. And the folks who come to the farm to pick up their goose get a little farm tour. And just hanging out with you guys and saying hi has been a really nice experience and introducing folks to the dogs and to the cats and letting them see how geese can actually live and how ducks can live and talk about just how magically sustainable a goose actually is. And if you missed out on it this year, don't worry, I'll be doing it again next year. But I probably won't do that many more geese. All the geese that I hatched this year led to some very good numbers and I'll probably stay about flat to where I was this year because I think if I tried to add too much more as one person running a farm, I don't think I'd be able to sustain it. Which again gets back to the point that I was making and that Ben made where the more you scale up your operation, the more you actually make your operation less what made it successful. I mean, just take our geese for example, right? Our geese are raised here. So in the winter, I get their eggs. For the first couple of months, I sell their eggs to other people who live in warmer climates. But then comes April and I start hatching out those geese. I hatch as many goslings as I can. I sell a fair amount of those goslings to people locally here who are in need of their own geese. And then all the other goslings that I have, I raise and I feed them like 90% of their diet straight from the pasture. And to me, that feels very sustainable. And then I butcher and sell most of them for meat in the fall. The 20 or so birds that you see now here on the farm, actually I think it's 19, 
they're my breeding flock for next year. And so they will produce future goslings who will be future geese for other people as well as future food for other people. But just the butchering challenges alone would keep me from trying to scale this up to a thousand geese. But I would absolutely love it if I could inspire a thousand other people to raise geese for meat as well. And geese became as popular as chickens as a meat bird. Because as you guys know, geese have a much smaller carbon footprint relative to ducks or chickens or turkeys. And so if you truly want to eat sustainable meat, or at least the most sustainable form of poultry, I should say, the goose is the magical animal for that. And yes, you're going to see my breeding flock of geese eat grain. Come the winter months, they have to eat grain. I suppose for this extra bonus summer that we're having right now, I could try to segregate them from the ducks, but it just becomes a lot more work for me personally and harder for me to sustain. And so if I'm trying to balance being a one-person farm with scaling up, it's a very hard thing to do. And you inevitably have to make trade-offs. Bonnie, Belinda, hey Kels, come on Kels, come here girls. How's my Belinda Carlisle doing? You doing good girl? Yeah? Well, it's time to move you girls to fresh pasture today. Which I know is always your favorite. <laughs> Just do me a favor and don't try to knock me down. I gotta set up the fence first. You know, this year on the farm, I've been a little bit at a crossroads in terms of the future growth and where I'm gonna go with things. It's been my second year of full-time farming, and if I was really gonna try to grow the farm the way I initially thought I would, I should have scaled up significantly this year with, you know, doubling or tripling my cattle herd, probably doing three times as many pigs, doubling the amount of geese that I do, and even like buying goslings and shipping them in. But I made the conscious choice to just focus on improving my skills as a farmer and getting better versus taking the same thing that I have and scaling it up. As the farming season for 2023 starts to wind down and I start to think about what I'm gonna do for 2024, a big part of my thinking is how do I continue on that trajectory versus the traditional scale up mindset. Like how do I take the things that I'm doing and make them even more sustainable and make them more repeatable for all sorts of folks who have an interest in agriculture and wanna get started but are looking for an approach that they could start with. And so yes, I'll probably end up adding sheep to the farm next year and I'll probably end up adding more cattle and I'm gonna have more chickens but I would not say that my objective next year is gonna be to scale up meanwhile somewhere on the internet I've seen better farming in a fifth grade diorama competition frankly the term farm management seems lost on you my friend you run this agricultural circus like it's a gosh darn petting zoo designed by a committee and let's talk about your revenue streams books merchandise sponsorships what happened to the good old days when a farm was a farm and not a backdrop for a YouTube channel. Ah, but you're an author now, aren't you? Writing books about the farm you can't properly manage seems like a cry for help disguised as literature. What's your next title? How to finance your farming failure with t-shirts and mugs? Ah, the farm life. <laughs> More like the farce life, I say. Rush delivery available. Call and order right now. So yesterday, I ended up painting the doors to the hoop coop. I went to my local building supply store and I said, give me the cheapest possible paint you got. They had it marked for 15, I ended up paying 10. It looks like a pretty gosh darn good deal to me. What do you think, Toby Dog? Now what we gotta do is put the locks on the doors. You ready for that project, kid? But I will say, it's like roasting in here. I don't have the thermometer up, but it has to be easily 90, 100 degrees in here. Whew. I figure while I'm in here working right now, I might as well run the sprinklers because the crops are still growing. I mean, I still have new pumpkins sprouting up every single day. There's even some cabbage that's starting to form back here again. So far, I've produced 40 pumpkins out of this space and anticipate a bunch more before all is said and done. So now this door will be the door that the ducks and geese go in and out of. So when I'm releasing the quack in this winter, they'll be going through this door. So I'm reusing this old latch, but I lost the other side of the hardware, so I'm kind of making do with what I got. Release the Quacken! That seems to work. Toby Dog is sleeping. He likes it in here. So yes, perhaps this video is just a very long-winded way of me saying that I'm gonna keep my farm the size that it is because I feel like that might be the better path. And since I have the privilege of being able to have a funding source like social media content, I should really be pushing myself even harder on how do I make a more sustainable and repeatable model of farming. And so as you start to watch some of the things I do with the farm and the approaches that I have to managing the animals, it's going to be how do I become more sustainable? How do I continue to treat the animals the right way and how do I make this whole thing repeatable so that other people can do it too this way the door stays open during the day